Good morning. Uh, my name is Asli Arpak. Um, my academic research lies in the field of shape and form studies, uh, shape grammars, computational theories of design. Uh, and I specifically studied the creation of designerly form in procedural, formalist, aesthetic, and psychological propositions. Um, my background lies in computational design, research, and pedagogy in my graduate studies. And currently, I'm teaching at the Nubu Studio, which is based in Cambridge. And also, I'm an adjunct professor at the Wentworth Institute of Technology. Uh, today, I'm very happy to talk to you about creating shape, form, sign, and advertently artistic style. Uh, I'm going to talk about such designerly shape and form, uh, especially in the early academic tradition of painting and design. Uh, by investigating signage that was part of retail architecture and built environment. In order to understand this academic visual tradition, uh, I'm going to revisit uh, an early American decorative art form of the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. Uh, those are being sign design, painting, and making. Uh, and I will do this particularly through a formalist understanding of them. Uh, I will trace a uniquely American homespun visual tradition that I believe culminated in a uniquely American modernism in design theory later in the late 19th century and early 20th centuries. Uh, through examples, uh, I will ex explore the pictorial, aesthetic, and representational qualities of signage and paintings. This formalist gaze, I believe, gives us uh, better insight on how early American artists, artisans, and craftsmen practiced, but even more importantly, uh, how they simultaneously created and navigated a very unique American way of seeing, uh, how they simultaneously discovered their new world and opportunities in that world through unique pictorial representation uh, ways of being creative and visual discovery. Pictorial and aesthetic features of early American decorative painting and ornamentation, uh, again, that is architectural, furniture, sign and coach decoration, captured and displayed important aspects of an emerging American tradition in pictorial representation and creativity. Especially in sign and coach painting, uh, we yet again encounter the age-old inquiry uh, in art, its aesthetics, and its psychology. Do our pictorial representations need to be true to the nature of things they aim to represent? Uh, as Nelson Goodman put it, um, what would such a truth mean in art and design? The most common response to such a question today among lay people um, would be that the truth equals perceptually loyal and recognizable that is realistic representation. As noted by the likes of art historian Ernst Gombrich and design theorist Rudolf Arnheim in the 20th century, uh, these art forms to be an illusion onto human perception and psychology. But if you want to go beyond that description, uh, beyond the mere goal of attaining pictorial and perceptual resemblance or likeness, what becomes of the relationship between pictures and the objects they depict? And today in our context, to be more specific, uh, in what ways would the nature of pictorial representation, if any, uh, representation ch change, if any, once the painting literally becomes a sign for something? Once it li literally becomes a pointer, it points at something else other than itself. In linguistic and logical terms, American philosopher and mathematician Charles S. Pierce uh, described sign as a stimulus pattern that has a meaning or that, that evokes some sort of meaning. We know of different ki kinds of signs, uh, such as the icon, the index, and the symbol, but this difference does not lay in what kind of meaning that is attached to a sign, but exactly how the meaning happens to be attached to that particular sign. Um, for example, icons um, have a physical re resemblance between this signal and the meaning. Uh, indices, on the other hand, have a correlation in space 
and time with its meaning through a particularly sensory feature. Uh, for example, if A points to some, something, if A, A points to B, A hints at the expectation of a behaviorally relevant pattern for an animal. And symbols, lastly, uh, which are things like content like nouns, verbs, and adjectives, are some patterns for us that get a, a particular meaning, uh, primarily from its mental association with symbols and secondarily from its correlation with environment, environmental patterns. And to note, symbols are the most abstract forms of science uh, and can be context-free. It doesn't have to be physically and in real time connected to a stimulus. Uh, and humans are the only kinds of animals, as far as we know, uh, who can utilize symbols at this very abstract level. Uh, and these symbols can be words, they can be verbal, but again, in our artistic context, they can be nonverbal, they can be visual as well. Oh, this was supposed to fly in. And when we consider signage um, and the very long history, art history, uh, what other interesting factors can be at play that, might, that may supply artistic creativity uh, when we expand our understanding from this truthfulness to picture making and sign making beyond the painterly illusion? Can we explore new create creative potentials in the relationship among artists, the observer, the sign, and the signified? <clears throat> And when we look at this long tradition, uh, we see various attempts in answering this question, uh, going from the Greeks chasing a good life um, in a very simplistic short art history um, note, um, to medieval st scholastic painting, French orthographic painting, and finally reaching the Renaissance with the optical illusions of the perspective. Uh, but in the later 20th century, Gestaltists uh, have questioned such, an, uh, such a truthfulness through creating these beautiful illusions that show multiple perceptions at the same time. Moving into, back into the history of signage, uh, handmade by artisans and craftsmen, trade signs and coach paintings, were widespread in the United States, especially in the colonial times. Uh, trade signs advertised businesses and as part of the built environment, served as an intermediary function, signaling at a utility ahead. Uh, it associated a particular function with the architectural space. And again, just like the stimulus pattern, it created this um, sign that is behaviorally relevant to us in our everyday lives. And descending from a long lineage, which can be traced back to Greek and Roman times, um, trade signs featured highly iconic visual images or sculptural forms that very simply and straightforwardly represented the nature of that business. Using iconic visuals or artifacts were initially necessary as the literacy rates were, were very low. In the early colonial United States, uh, literacy rates continued to remain low and trade signs maintained the practice. However, what was once a necessity in such terms became an artistic tradition later on. Increasingly, while words and creative typography were incorporated into trade signs, visual, graphical, and sculptural features continued to be studied. So the indexical, iconic, and symbolic values kept remain uh, to be studied. And the stylistic features of the contemporary early American painting and sign painting coincide in many ways. Early American portraiture or landscape painting, for example, share with sign painting a flatness uh, and a reliance on line and surface. Simple geometries, simple shapes, and simple compositions were sought after. Visuality of this kind fundamentally differed from the visually, visual tradition that specifically sought that painterly illusion. There were a number of important reasons for this. Uh, firstly, many uh, early American painters lacked the academic training 
uh, that their contemporaries would have pursued in Europe. Uh, many of them were self-educated or they worked in small workshops learning from a master. Some later sought mentorship in Europe if they could afford it uh, or if they were able to travel and connect with masters in their workshops and, or at the academies. Towards the end of the 19th century, American academies, drawing and design schools were established and they began to implement a more structured academic training, but the visual tradition survived. Oh, wow. okay. Secondly, the artists of sign painting were also artisans and craftsmen. In the early centuries, these distinctions were not yet very clear cut. Earlier signs were initially two-dimensional and self-standing. Uh, they featured two painted flat sides. They were mostly stationed on the street outside the shop, catching the gazes of the passers-by at the street level. Increasingly, these trade signs began to be elevated and hung off of the facades of the shops. Some still remained very two-dimensional. They were either fitted onto the facade in a parallel manner, um, facing outward to the street, hanging off of the facade in a perpendicular fashion. Uh, some others were positioned this way so they could, the front and back faces could be seen both from both directions and from farther away. As the numbers, number of shops increased with the spirit of competi competition, uh, trade signs also increasingly became three-dimensional and very interesting. Uh, I was particularly interested to trace uh, dentist signs or doctor signs and optometrist signs. Here are some very curious ones that I came upon. Um, there are many teeth carved out of wood and hung off of facades uh, or these would be positioned within the doctor's office in the window. And some curious optometrist ones. And I particularly like the uh, bottom three. Um, you can see design-wise, design the same elements keep appearing. Uh, but what is just a banner here can later become a mustache. <laughs> or something like the bridge geometry can imply eyebrows. Uh, while these three-dimensional examples um, explored this iconic, mean, iconic form of sign creation, uh, I'm more in, I was more interested in this study to trace the painterly, uh, painterly ones, so the, kind of like the ones that are the last two. Um, artisans and craftsmen of this time simply preferred to work with simpler geometries and colors that would be relatively easier to produce. Uh, and that would graphically have a higher impact, a higher contrast, and higher figure-ground relationship. Uh, one other reason for this is that uh, artisans and craftsmen also utilized traditional crafts techniques uh, of the time, but as well as creating their idiosyncratic techniques, so they had to be simple, uh, their own tools and their own colors. The color scheme of the early American painting is very particular because the artists had very specific pigments and oils at their disposal and experimented with their own mixing methods. Uh, while all of these points factored into the creation of a unique visual style, maybe the most important aspect though uh, was the imagination and intention of the American artist. Um, Puritanism in New England especially uh, indeed openly disdained the idea of the illusion. Uh, nature and art were not to be seen as, mean, as some sort of means to indulge the senses. The engagement was to be kept in the form of a modest, very covert affection. Uh, the realistic illusion constituted a dangerous platform uh, which simultaneously entertained and overindulged and in a way fooled the senses. Uh, so for these reasons, Puritan artists or Puritanism that is deeply rooted in artistic tradition found solace in simpler geometries as they felt to carry more certainty rather than the illusion itself. They developed a deeper trust in this line and surface study uh, than illusory light and shadow play in two-dimensional design and means of symbolism through such a visual language. So they really studied abstract shape, form and color. 
Puritan thought therefore has produced a deep-seated belief in abstraction in artistic and designerly thinking, artistic representation and what it means to be creative uh, for the American artists. In addition, the art and craft of sign painting and its methods seem to have left its traces, especially stylistically, in the mature period of artists. Uh, sign painting especially was a form of initiation into the artist, uh, into art for an, for an early um, American artist who might later move on to a more academic tradition. So despite, despite this common thread of abstraction, uh, there are still some diverse stylistic features among trade science touching upon fundamental themes in artistic endeavor, perception, and psychology. So now I walk through some of these interesting examples that I, I found. Uh, and I think these feature varying degrees of abstraction. Um, for instance, like the tavern sign here uh, on the left, uh, some signs featured more um, detailed painting of what looks like the actual building they tried to advertise or the actual site that the building was positioned. Uh, others, like the one on the right, uh, include a very easily recognizable iconic symbol like the elm tree. Uh, although there is a huge tradition of and symbolism of trees, again, in New England thought. So it could also, in, in addition to the iconic meaning, it could also get a symbolic meaning in that manner. So there is that ambiguity in the meaning. Um, again, inspired by the port portrait, portraiture, uh, some signs featured a character or the owner of that particular inn in a more what seems to be a realistic manner, while other signs, like the Boston baked bean signs on the right, exaggerated features, uh, it kind of caricat caricaturized the figures. Um, and while some were very, very two-dimensional, some also attempted their a hand in pictorial perspective, like this shop from Massachusetts. Uh, it has a very simple pictorial perspective on the one side and the typography on the other side. Um, <clears throat> there were also various animals which were anato anatomically incorrect um, and there were much more flattened attempts of glasses and bottles, especially on tavern signs. Uh, these are very flattened images that enliven, enliven iconographic meaning. Uh, in addition to highlighting and embedding significant cultural symbols, um, like the one on the left, uh, and maybe American values, uh, there were also signs which featured things like anchors or nautical themes uh, based on the town that this shop was uh, located in. But also, I, I believe uh, this in, in signage uh, also has a double meaning in terms of like you can anchor at this in tonight. So it could, again, have that amb ambiguous meaning. Uh, in addition to specialized town signage, there were also specialized signs for specific groups like the Masonic signs. Uh, you can recognize them by the compass and rulers. Um, some also combine these Masonic, and pet, Masonic features with patriotic ones. Uh, okay, I'll just skip because I'm running out of time. Uh, and finally, I just wanted to show this example. Not all of the figures uh, needed to be from our real world. They could also be very imaginary. This is a shop sign I found uh, from New England. And I just know that the design here that is on the wheels kept reappearing in architectural ornamentation, in, in, in interior design or at the facades of the building. But I need to decipher the symbolic meanings behind all these figures. So finally, uh, even though we have a relatively small inventory of sign painting today, uh, early American artists, designers, and craftsmen succeeded in leaving us with a rich pictorial legacy uh, to ponder upon what it me 
may mean to imagine, create, and make signs and make art in the in this sense. Um, and I believe what uh, a homespun visual tradition uh, from the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries uh, through this craft practice uh, actually culminated in a very unique form of American thought and American modernism. Uh, so later in the 19th century, we have design theorists like uh, Daniel Walder Ross or Arthur Wesley Dow um, who really locked down on the points, lines, planes and surfaces uh, and solids in the study of art. So they developed design theories which were very modern. Um, we usually follow a Eurocentric narrative when we talk about such modernism, which talks about design elements and design principles. But actually, I believe we have a very unique American tradition that we are operating in today. And I believe studying signage in this sense can give us more insight. And that concludes my thought, my talk. If you have any comments or questions. We'll do that at the end oh, of the at panel. At the end? Okay. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you.